Hello and welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you very much for coming and joining us today in this discussion of what if your mind can be read. Now this session is part of the What If series, which is a set of discussions that we're having this week uh, about the implications of socially disruptive technology. Uh, so I'm Ihan Cho from the scientific journal Nature, and I am a member of WEF's Global Agenda Council on Brain Research. And today we're going to talk about an aspect of neuroscience that I think is one of the most interesting and at the same time uh, most complex. Uh, which is mind reading. Now, what is mind reading? First of all, although you probably don't think of it this way, we are all mind readers. So every time we interact with another person, when you're talking to your friends and family, when you're engaged in an intense business negotiation, you are trying to infer what the other person is thinking and feeling, and using all the information available to you to make that inference about what this person believes um, and, and what this person feels. And so what, what's new here? What's new is that we're faced with the prospect that we can use technology to enhance that process of divining other people's uh, beliefs and, and thoughts and feelings and uh, possibly memories. Um, and so today we have a fantastic panel who is going to take us through uh, some of these new technological advances and their potential impacts, and also help us think about some of the questions uh, that accompany these, ad these advances. So uh, first of all, we have Ariel Garden, who is the co-founder and CEO of Interaxon. Then we have Morali Dorswami, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral science from Duke University. Uh, Nita Farahani also joins us from Duke University, where she is a professor of law and philosophy. And last but not least, we have Thomas Insel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Now, before we go to the panel, um, we would like to hear from you. So, uh, can we get the, the questions up, please? So, uh, we have been running, WEF has been running an online poll uh, this past few days. Um, asking uh, you know, people who have visited the website uh, who you would, in principle, trust to have access to your thoughts and memories. Okay, so um, we're gonna go through with a show of hands and uh, you're just gonna say you know, you know, which one you agree with. So who would trust no one with their thoughts? Okay, <laughs> all right. How you're about allowed to vote more than once. Okay, yes, you can vote more than once. So who would trust their employer with their thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> How about your doctor? Okay, and a judge? Okay, the police? And the government? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so just for comparison, uh, you want to see the, the results of the online poll. It matches up pretty well. So now I'm going to turn it over to the panel, and I'm going to ask each of you to take uh, about five minutes to introduce to us um, some technology that you find particularly interesting and what you think the potential impact might be. So I think there's a lot of possibility for impact when we begin to understand what's on our minds. And one of my, mo the things I'm most excited about is the ability to understand our internal state. When we look at the improvements that we've been able to make in our bodily and our physical health by being able to fully understand our bodies, the same opportunity exists for us in the mind. In some ways, we are kind of in the dark ages in terms of our own understanding of our brain, its function, and how it creates experience. And when we think about where the state of medicine was in the dark ages, we really don't want to be there today where we are in the dark ages with our own brains. Um, and we think of what we've been able to do for diseases like polio that we've been able to eradicate. Think about what we'll be able to do for age-related cognitive decline or Alzheimer's memory loss when we're able to actually understand our mental process more effectively. One of the tools that's becoming readily available for understanding the mind um, is EEG, and I work in the space of EEG, particularly consumer-facing EEG. And with that, you cannot read your thoughts. All you can really do is detect changes in the state of your mind. So you can know when you are focused, when you're relaxed, when your mind is active, when you're drowsy. And that allows you to create experiences like one that we've built, which is a meditation tool. 
that can teach you how to meditate by being able to actually hear what's going on in your own mind. So you know when your mind is focused and when your, when your mind is wandering. We have over 100 different research institutions that use the tool to look at autism, epilepsy, ADHD, and more. ADHD is one place where this kind of EEG technology can have great impact. If you're a kid with ADHD, your entire life people tell you to focus, and you have no idea what that means. And now with EEG tools, you can show a kid who has ADHD what it looks like to focus, what happens in their brain when they focus, and then teach them to be able to do so. We can detect drowsiness so that as you start to fall asleep at the wheel, we can give you a notification you can wake back up again or notify your loved one that you may be in an accident shortly. <laughs> Important things. Another technology that has a lot of promise is uh, mind reading for the ability to control a neuroprosthetic. So individuals that do not have uh, limbs can now potentially control their limbs through neural prosthetics. There's a technology at a brown university called BrainGate that allows a person with ALS, no motion in their body, to control a robotic arm just by thinking about it. When we look down the road at the implications for this technology, there are things that we do need to be aware of and cautiously concerned about. We all understand the importance of privacy, as this poll just demonstrated, that we don't want others to have access to the contents of our own mind. And so I am deeply in the belief that we have to advocate for and be ahead of the curve in notions around privacy and brain data. So we created an organization, CEREB, Center for Responsible Brainwave Technologies, that creates a set of standards for the upcoming industry around privacy, agency, security, efficacy, and transparency, which we'll probably talk more about. Thank you. Morali? Good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with this uh, eminent audience and this distinguished panel. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, functional MRI. Functional MRI is an application of magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, that can measure neural activity, either at rest, or while someone is thinking of something, or while someone is performing a task. And it does this by measuring blood flow and blood oxygen changes in the brain. Unlike EEG, uh, it's not as fast in terms of its temporal resolution, but it has excellent spatial resolution, and it can image deep parts of the brain. So with fMRI now, people are beginning to do some very primitive forms of mind reading, and Nita is going to get into that. Um, I'm going to talk about one application that I think is very profound and could essentially even redefine what we think of at brain death and how we view consciousness. So a common problem in neurology, uh, many, many tens of thousands of people worldwide suffer traumatic brain injuries, stroke, and other kinds of neurological problems that either leave them paralyzed or unconscious or in a vegetative state. And doctors have to determine whether they are brain dead or not, because if they're brain dead, they no longer have to be on life support, and perhaps uh, the family would uh, indicate that their organs can be donated to help other individuals so that they fulfill whatever their wishes were. But if they're not brain dead, then the hospital has to redouble its efforts to keep them alive and try to bring them out of it if there's a chance that they may recover. And until recently, we didn't really have good, reliable techniques. The normal way uh, in practice is two neurologists would assess the person using a neurological exam, maybe they would do an EEG, uh, but a lot of times uh, it's not clear cut. So recently, with functional MRI, it has become possible to instruct this person who even though they are paralyzed, they may not be able to say anything, to imagine that they're doing something. In one instance, they asked such a patient to imagine that she was playing tennis. And they showed that the supplemental motor area in her cortex that would normally light up when you play tennis uh, was lighting up. And they also asked a control person who was healthy to do the same thing and they showed that the same area was lighting up in the control person. So with that information, uh, they were actually able to determine that this person was perhaps not brain dead and retained some minimal consciousness. They went one step further with another patient who had been assumed to be brain dead for almost 10 years. And the doctors in the hospital were considering taking this person off life support. They asked this person to visualize again whether the person is playing tennis or not, 
But in this case, they tied it to a question. They said, if you are in pain, then don't imagine that you're playing tennis. If you're not in pain, imagine that you're playing tennis. And then the person's motor cortex again lit up, indicating that the patient was signaling to the doctor that the patient was not in pain. So now, I think we have a technology, uh, 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 scientists have actually begun to catalog how the brain responds to various kinds of pictures, thousands of pictures. So for example, the brain has a specific activity for pizza versus some other kind of food. So it may be possible in the future for a minimally conscious patient to indicate, hey, I want some pizza and beer today, just through analysis of their brain fMRI activity patterns. Again, this is a prediction, but I think it has the potential to help tens of thousands of patients who are kind of in a limbo and change the way we practice neurology. Um, so I'm a bioethicist and a lawyer. I am not a neuroscientist or a technologist. And so I'm going to speak a little bit more about some of the ethical and legal implications of technologies um, that I've been thinking about. So I'm going to give you uh, a little bit less of the grounded facts today of what we can do and forecast some of the applications of these technologies that you just heard about. Um, so I'll start with fMRI following from Morali's analysis. There's a researcher, and this is real science, there's a researcher by the name of Jack Gallant at UC Berkeley who ran a pretty fantastic experiment, which is probably as close as we can really come to mind reading today. What he did was he took test subjects and he showed those subjects thousands of different images, video clips that he had downloaded from YouTube. Not ones that he created, just random YouTube clips. And he created a computer algorithm because he's a computer scientist as well as a neuroscientist. And he showed the computer those same images as well as the functional magnetic resonance imaging scans, the real-time blood oxygenation activity in the brains of the participants while they watch these videos. And the computer started to learn. This video or this segment of this video means this pattern of activation in the brain. He then gave the subjects new YouTube videos to watch, and he didn't give the computer those videos. All he gave the computer was the blood oxygenation information from fMRI that the participants had while watching those videos. And then the computer had to guess, what was this person seeing? And the computer did a pretty remarkable job. If you see the images, if you go onto his website, you can see pretty fuzzy images because he only went to several levels, layers, into what's called the visual cortex, the area of visual representation in your brain. Um, but just with that, you can see pretty well the types of videos and images, videos, that a person was seeing. So that's about as close as you can get to mind reading, which is if I tell you, imagine what you had for breakfast, that has a visual representation on your visual cortex, and using fMRI and this kind of algorithm, we could predict what it is that you're seeing and therefore try to decode what it was that you had for breakfast. He's likewise done so by reading stories to people and then trying to create a brain um, kind of dictionary based on language representation in different areas of the brain. That's about as close as we can get to real kinds of mind reading. EEG technology that Ariel talked about um, really is just about electrical changes in your brain. So you would think you can't get that much information from that. But just as Ariel said, we could, for example, figure out if you are drowsy. And in fact, Jaguar just announced that they have started to develop technology to put into the headrests of cars so that they can see when a person is becoming drowsy. Now imagine who might want that information besides just you and your loved one. What if insurance companies could know when you're drowsy? You happen to drive while drowsy a lot? That's the leading cause of accidents in the United States, I suspect worldwide, is drowsy driving. What if when you're walking down the street, you could be wearing one of these consumer-based EEG devices, and it's hooked up to your iPhone, and you've given the company who runs those headbands on the application access to that data. So all of you said no one, except for the one person who wanted to give his information to the government, and the few of you who wanted to give the information to their doctors. Imagine a scenario in which you would be willing to give information to companies because you're getting some sort of benefit, like finding out what your resting state is, finding out what your attentive state is. Imagine we could also see whether or not you're hungry. So you're walking down the street, 
and you have your iPhone or other mobile device hooked up to this technology, and you start to get a little bit hungry, and that has a difference and change in your brain. That signal is sent up to your EEG device that you're reading, which then talks to your phone through Bluetooth technology and informs it that you're hungry, and your phone knows your GPS location in the world. And so as you come across that nice sushi restaurant, all of a sudden pops up on your phone a 20% coupon if within the next half hour you go and you have a little bite to eat at that local sushi restaurant. Would you be willing to give up information for that kind of thing? Probably. We do it already with fitness trackers all the time. So what happens when we start to be able to pick up just these differences like hungry, paying attention or not? The implications are that we first willingly give up that information. Do we start, start to unwillingly give up that information as well? Do companies, for example, start to want to have access to productivity information while you're working, whether or not you are paying attention and focused or your mind is wandering? Do health insurance companies start to want to know before you're going to have an epileptic seizure to be able to gauge whether or not you're a risk? Do legal companies, do legal services, do judicial systems start to want to have access to the information like that that I told you about Jack Gallant's work in order to decode what an eyewitness saw when they claim that they saw a crime? Or better still, when they bring in a suspect for a crime and they want to know whether or not that suspect was in fact the person who committed the crime, could they decode the visual imagery from that person's brain through some sort of priming of a memory of what they were doing the evening of the crime in question. These are the types of questions that I think about, not only what the promise of the technology is, but what some of the potential implications are for privacy, for our sense of self, for our ability to be able to navigate the world with having some kind of cognitive liberty in our brains. This is already a really interesting conversation, Ian. So uh, I'll um, take this in a slightly different direction as a psychiatrist who thinks a lot about um, how can we learn more about what people are experiencing so that uh, we can uh, relieve the pain of depression or um, help young people who are becoming psychotic. Uh, and the hope has been that um, either through EEG or through uh, neuroimaging, we would get much better at being able to do this uh, than we could by listening carefully. Uh, it's actually not quite clear yet that uh, technology has given us what we need to be able to, if you would like, read the minds of people who are um, going through some very painful experiences. What's so fascinating, though, is that um, behavior itself and the ability to um, observe behavior more objectively may be able to be one of the best tools um, for decoding the mind and for actually beginning to understand what's going on, even outside of subjective awareness. Uh, I was really struck, uh, Ihan, by the, the uh, graph that you put up, that 68% uh, of people said that they didn't want anybody to see their thoughts or to monitor their behavior, and yet uh, every one of us is sharing our behavior every day online in extensive ways um, that it is being used uh, in a very deep way uh, to sell us stuff. Uh, so we seem to be fine to have our um, behavior monitored so carefully for marketing purposes, but for some reason it's not yet comfortable for us to use that for health purposes. I'm not sure I fully understand why that's such a gap here, but I bring this up as an example because you could just imagine that one of our best biomarkers, if you will, for when somebody becomes, is becoming psychotic uh, is their search history. What kinds of things are they beginning to explore on the internet? Or for that matter, what sorts of questions are their parents asking on the internet to try to understand what's happening with their child? And if that isn't one of our best ways of uh, getting the early picture of what's going on to a mind that's disintegrating. But an even perhaps more accurate way, it doesn't involve particularly high technology, although it does involve some very high uh, force computing, and that is the ability to decode speech in a very deep way using what's called semantic mapping and speech analytics. Uh, and that has been increasingly um, a, a very powerful way for 
helping us to understand what's going on in someone's mind even before we can detect that uh, by doing an interview. Uh, it's, you can use a computer to decode speech and pick up details of, um, of mental organization or disorganization that's far more uh, sensitive than what we can pick up clinically in just interviewing somebody. Uh, so in addition to EEG and fMRI and other high-tech approaches, often very expensive approaches that will come up, I think just being able to <coughs> Uh, decode behavior, and particularly speech, but also such things as search behavior, uh, activity. Um, there's an enormous amount of information in that that we're simply not using well enough yet uh, to be able to help us on questions not so much of mind reading, but of mental health. This is uh, shaping up to be a really interesting conversation. Um, so I'd like to turn now, uh, we, we've talked about you know, the potential positive impacts and, and how this could enhance the well-being of individuals and, and the functioning of, of uh, bodies and in society. So what are some of the potential misuses of this technology that we should be keeping in mind um, as it goes forward? With the assumption that, you know, all of these, these technologies are going to advance and, you know, things are going to get better, um, that uh, we are going to be able to predict people's mental states and uh, the, their thoughts more accurately. What, what are some of the red lines? I'm going to jump in here because I feel quite strongly about this. And these are issues that we think about each and every day as we build these tools. Um, so one of the applications that I believe is really not a great idea, not tenable, is what Nita brought up, and that is neuromarketing. The um, un without giving permission for your brain data to be used to then sell you things that you may not recognize that you need. And marketing happens in a wide variety of ways today based on our online behavior, et cetera. And to my belief, the brain should be you know, your last bastion of privacy where that data should not be used to market against you, to you effectively. And so we take a lot of pains to ensure that that doesn't happen and that our technologies aren't used in that way and won't be. Right, but this uh, speaks to the point that, that Tom mentioned, which is that we are already giving out information you know, uh, about the contents of our brain for marketing purposes. So uh, what, what is the distinction between you know, getting this information from, from our behavior and you know, what our likes on Facebook as opposed to getting it directly you know, from our brain activity? You know? a, oh, okay, sorry. Um, so the, the scenario that I was imagining is one in which a person voluntarily does so, right? I mean, this isn't a lack of consent. And, and I don't find it problematic for a person to choose to be able to do so. In fact, we do it all the time, as you point out, right? So we opt into all sorts of free services, which are really services that are designed to discover our likes and preferences through pushing like buttons or what our Google search history is or any other kind of search behavior to predict what it is that we might like to buy. And maybe that makes our lives a lot more convenient because we get ads that are much more targeted to things that we're interested in and that we might in fact purchase. Um, in fact, there have been things that have showed up in my Facebook feed where I thought, oh wow, that's a neat new device that's come out or a neat new pair of shoes that's come out. I would love to have that thing and I will buy it because they've figured out my preferences. Um, and if I happen to be really hungry and I also happen to really like sushi and I'm walking past a sushi restaurant and I've given up my GPS location and I've given access to my brain for marketing purposes, I think that's just fine. Um, I think the risk, as Ariel points out, is uh, when we start to go beyond that. So this idea that there's this last bastion of freedom, that's true in some ways, although we've already given the keys to that last bastion of freedom away through many of the different ways in which we give access to our behavior, as Tom points out. So I think it's if we could go a step further, if we could get to the point where you know most of you sitting in the room are hopefully listening, but you're also thinking about five other things at once. And every now and then something pops into your mind that you wouldn't want your neighbor to know about or you wouldn't want your loved one to know about. Um, and if all of a sudden there's a big thought bubble above your head and we can see all of that information, I think that's when we start to get really scared. We don't want that to happen. Even the drowsy button might be a problem here. Even the drowsy button might be a problem. Although I'll tell you, um, one thing that I've thought about using a technology similar to one that um, Ariel's company is developing, there's a company, NeuroSky, that has this EEG device that has little cat ears, and the cat ears come down when you are getting drowsy and then go back up when you're alert. And I thought that would be great to use in my classroom so that as the students start to get a little drowsy, I could just you know, wake them up a little bit. Um, so, 
but that, that might be getting access to, to information that Ariel would be uncomfortable with if I could know the drowsy state of my students without their consent. But I think one of the issues here at Yen is that it, 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 you're right, that a lot of this is going on anyway. The, to me, one of the risks is in over-interpreting what these tools can do. I think Morali has given us a great example of one place where it's clear that fMRI can tell you something you wouldn't know otherwise. Mm -hmm. There are not a lot of examples of that. And the, the lesson is that so far, the technology's at a place where the variation that you see is greater than what you might even get from just interviewing people and, getting the, and asking them what they're thinking about. We're just not getting the sort of precision out of these instruments that we might have expected um, when we started. That's not to say we won't be there in a few years, but with the tools we have now, I think we're pretty limited in being able to do nearly the kind of sort of mind reading that people might be most concerned about. I think we need to be thinking about the potentials, but we should also be realistic about what is the true risk given the limits of the, of the tools we have. Just to, to push back a little bit on that, I'm sorry, Ariel, which is, you're right, absolutely. Um, and yet, we already see attempts to use the technology, right? So if you take fMRI-based recognition information that Morali discussed, um, people have tried to use that for lie detection purposes as well. Uh, and we are forever looking for this holy grail of being able to tell when somebody's telling the truth or lying. And there's nowhere that that's more true than in the criminal justice system. We def desperately want to know, is this person telling the truth or not? Um, and there are companies that have cropped up that uh, started with a basic claim, which is if you are telling the truth, it has less cognitive load than if you're lying. Therefore, if we look on an fMRI-based analysis of your brain and ask you a series of questions, if your brain is doing more work in certain regions, then that's consistent with lying. If you're telling the truth, then it's going to do less work. There's lots of reasons why that's problematic, but these companies claimed 97% accuracy in being able to tell whether or not you're telling the truth or telling a lie. And there have already been five cases in the United States where people have tried to use fMRI-based lie detection. And we have gatekeepers in the US, that is the judges serve a role where they have to decide if a piece of information has gotten to the point of scientific credibility such that it could be admitted into the courtroom. And so far, it hasn't been let in past the gatekeeper. But it's a matter of time, I think, uh, and a, you know, a matter of the context in which it's introduced, people will rely on it and it isn't particularly accurate. So this is exactly why it's so important to be clear what the tools can do and what they can't do. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad Nita's on our neuroethics board for the brain initiative, it's exactly <laughs> what we need. Uh, because these are really important issues that people have to understand that the, the sort of, the, the hype uh, is actually more dangerous here than the hope. And we got to get clear about what really can be done with the technology we have today. And it's something, it has some value, but it's not nearly as precise as we might think. To follow up on that point, everybody always gets excited about using EEG to control stuff with their mind. Um, and you can control basic things with EEG by modulating your state from focus to relax. You can make a light brighter or make a light dimmer. But that's it. You can't drive something in complex directions. You can't make decisions. You can't say, well, I'm turning on this light now, not that light. Um, there's absolutely nothing that we can't do much, much, much better with our hands. And being able to control stuff with your mind is decades in the future. But very common misconception. Although, you know, you have to confess at this point that um, if we were mice, we'd be having a very different conversation. <laughs> Because uh, in the research that's going on with mice, it's actually quite amazing how not only can we um, identify the cells that seem to represent a particular memory, we can turn on those cells to bring the memory back, we can delete those cells to delete the memory, we can take a positive memory and turn it into a negative memory, and we can do the reverse. So, um, I, I, you know, I don't know whether you would call that mind reading in a mouse, but if that's any preview of what the technology could mean for, uh, for humans, it's pretty stunning the extent to which we can both monitor and manipulate neural activity in mice to be able to change behavior. Okay, so this opens up a, a whole new set of questions. So now we're, we're going up beyond mind reading to the potential manipulation 
of the contents of the mind. Um, so where, where should the red line be there? So, I mean, we, we manipulate our brains in every possible way already, right? I mean, it's a question of, is there something unique and different about technological enhancements? How many of you had coffee or tea today? Fewer of you than I would have thought. If yes. you have jet how, lag, how much like of you I are do, answering you'd be truthfully. Living on, right, so be truthful. But I mean, so caffeine is a stimulant that we've all come to accept in society as a permissible stimulant to change your brain. Um, there are better drugs than caffeine potentially to be able to stimulate your brain um, and to alter your brain. So we could start with drugs as a way to change it. I'll give you one example that I think is interesting. There's been some research done on a drug called propanolol. Some of you may be on that drug. It's a beta blocker, which is a drug that's used for um, basically just heart conditions. Uh, but it turns out that it's a drug that a number of people have figured out has potential uses for them as well. So actors sometimes will take propanolol before they go on stage because it reduces their anxiety some. Um, and in fact, it reduces their anxiety enough that researchers took interest in seeing whether or not it might interfere with the fear that you experience and the chemical processes of fear and the neurological processes of fear. And so there's been some research done that suggests that your memories and the way you consolidate memories could be interfered with by taking propanolol. And that could be particularly useful for somebody who has suffered a traumatic event. So if a person suffers a sexual assault, for example, and comes into the hospital emergency room and is given propanolol, within the first few hours after they suffered the traumatic event, they will remember what happened, but the fear memory that's associated with that memory will be disaggregated so that they remember what happened, but they don't suffer the fear, which means they're unlikely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. But that manipulation of their minds, that manipulation of their memories, could make them a much less reliable witness against the person who committed the crime. And in the US, we have a civil recovery system. So if they sue the person who committed the crime, they would be given substantial damages, potentially money, for the pain and suffering that they experienced. But they would get far less money for the pain and suffering they experienced because they would have far less pain and suffering. Um, and that might come as a society that, to make us think of certain kinds of events and traumatic events as less traumatic because they have less of a psychological impact on people. So there's a lot we can do to change the contents of our mind just with simple drugs before we even get into the, some of the technologies that we can talk about. So, uh, yeah. Really. So I think with the brain stimulation technologies, the path that I think they will follow will be very similar to medications. A lot of the medications we're talking about, the nootropics, the cognitive enhancing drugs, were first tested for disease states, whether it be Alzheimer's, whether it be cognitive problems in other uh, psychiatric disorders. And then once they came on the market or if they failed uh, for whatever reason in their main indication, they oftentimes went over the market or they were used off-label. Uh, they were sometimes just sold um, in the black market or you know, patients would go to doctors and say, I want this off-label. And I think many of the uh, neurotechnologies, especially the brain stimulation technologies, especially if they're benign and don't cause uh, uh, side effects or don't require invasive surgery, are probably likely to go the same way. So there's one technology, uh, transcranial direct, <coughs> direct stimulation, where you can buy kits over the counter already. It delivers a very uh, small um, uh, um, electrical pulse. And there are some you know, conflicting reports as to whether it actually benefits you or not. But let's assume that a good study comes out saying that you give a small jolt in one side of your brain, it enhances your creativity. You give a jolt on the other side, it puts you to sleep and gives you a nice seven-hour nap. I think we'd all be doing it. So it's just a matter of time, and, and the evidence is not there yet. But I think people are working to develop the evidence. There's also, in uh, clinical usage, trans. Um, magnetic stimulation that has been very effectively deployed over the last decade, first primarily in depression, um, and has been very successful in ameliorating depression, now being used very often in autism in a form called M MRT, magnetic Re resonance therapy, or RMRT. And some of the results that we've been able to see in kids with autism have been beautiful. Kids that couldn't make eye contact after three weeks of sessions are able to make eye contact, communicate, and are clearly different, quote-unquote, healthier individuals after the treatment. 
So clinically, there's benefit. It's going to be a long time till magnetic therapies make their way into you know, sort of consumer tools like transcranial direct current stimulation have. So, so back to the issue of uh, you know setting realistic expectations and also realistic evaluation of what the technology can deliver. Um, are there, should there be different thresholds for different uses? So we, we've talked about potential commercial uses for self-enhancement of well-being and medical and also legal issues. So uh, do we need different thresholds for all of these? By thresholds, do you mean different regulatory structures or different uh, thresholds different for levels of cre it? credibility? You know? mm. I think uh, if the stakes are a lot higher, then we should be much more concerned, right? So I mentioned the gatekeeper function that judges serve. Um, and if we're talking about the criminal justice system, so we're talking about finding a person guilty of a crime and therefore depriving them of their liberty, potentially for a long period of time, I would think we'd want to have a very high degree of certainty about the reliability of the information before we would use it in that context. Um, but if I want to dim a light or um, play a game on my iPhone, like getting a golf ball into a hole uh, on my device by being able to get my brain into a particular brain state, that seem, to me seems like a mo much lower threshold that you would need because it's for entertainment purposes. So certainly I could imagine um, thinking about the consequences of the use of the information being one of the standards by which we would measure whether or not we would allow certain devices to come to the marketplace. I think, yeah, I, I would probably wouldn't use the word threshold as much as rigor. I think what you want to know is just how rigorous uh, is the evidence for uh, the use of any technology uh, and, and what its application could be. Uh, and I completely agree with Nita that it's going to depend on what the consequences of being wrong would be in each of these cases. For a game, it doesn't matter that much. But in the legal context, and maybe in a marketing context, we would be much more careful. So at Sarab Center for Responsible Brainwave Technologies, we've created, we're in the process of creating a set of standards for the entire brain industry around privacy. So baseline ensuring everybody always owns their own data and you can always rescind it from a server. It is your data, period. Transparency, that the tools and technologies that are used are very transparent and you can make your own decisions around them. Efficacy, meaning that the product does what it says it would. If it says that it's going to help your kid with ADHD, that there are reputable studies that back it up and that the scientific community believes this to be the case. Um, safety, that the applications are used in ways that are safe. And then agency, which is always the most important one to me, that no application ever impinges on your human agency. So with these sets of standards, um, these tools become something that we can have a set of guidelines to judge against and then be able to use things that are truly benign, like using an EG tool for meditation versus things that have a much higher level of risk associated with them, things like magnetic resonance therapy that's only clinical. Okay, um, I'd like to hear from the audience now. Does anybody have any questions for any of the speakers? Yeah, I think we have, um, go there first. We have a microphone, so if you could speak into the microphone. Hello, I'm Dana, I'm a Global Shaper from the Caracas Hub. And I was wondering, uh, you were talking a lot about mind reading, uh, but what happens when our mind makes up stuff or there are like gray areas? How does it work? Just like, for example, you ask now, how many of you had coffee? And sometimes you actually don't remember and you will say, no, I didn't drink coffee. And you know, you have that image in your head that, that you didn't. So how does it work? Or did you, I don't know, for example, you have the concept of, of something like, the, have you been, uh, been faith, faithful, for example, and you might say, yes, I, in my concept, I have been. <laughs> Your concept, maybe no. So how does it work? Because that's an, an interesting area when, when we reach that point. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, there's a couple of questions, I think, embedded within there. One is uh, potentially inaccurate or false memories, and the second is a kind of contextual difference in understanding. So I'll start with the false memory one. Um, one of my favorite researchers, and that I think that her studies are extraordinary in this area, is Elizabeth Loftus. Um, and she actually did a really nice TED talk that you could watch as well, where she talks about um, how easy it is to sort of trick the mind or to plant, in a sense, memories into a person's mind. So um, I might ask all of you, you know, did you have coffee this morning? And maybe the objective truth is no. 
but then I show you a picture of you sipping your coffee this morning, which actually was just a photoshopped picture of you sipping your coffee. And um, I described to you how, how you had told me this morning when I ran into you how it tasted and you thought that it had a beautiful crema on top and it was really rich and wonderful and that you added this delightful hazelnut cream to it. Anyway, I go on and on. And after a while, it starts to be something that you can taste and experience and visualize yourself and then you remember it. You remember it because you then consolidate it and you take the image that I've shown you and I have essentially planted a false memory. But to you, it's a very real experience that you had. You just didn't actually have it. And we're very bad right now at being able to discriminate between what are false memories and what are real memories, which is really one of the perils. The more we understand about the brain, the more it might be possible to manipulate your brain. So these standards that Ariel's talking about are really important, not just in this context, but in other contexts as well, because it is possible to manipulate and shape your own agency, your own sense of self, your own experiences. Um, and with respect to context and differences of context, very much how we see the world um, can shape our beliefs, or our beliefs can shape how we see things. And so um, I might perceive one thing, you might be in the same room and perceive it entirely differently because the context in which you're seeing it is different. And between the two, it isn't as if one is right and the other is wrong. It just shows us that our memories and our thoughts are not some sort of recording device like the video cameras in the back of the room, but they are context specific and driven by our own experiences. So if I were ever able to read out your mind for a legal context, I couldn't really rely on it as if it was a video camera because it's your personal perception and shaped view of the world rather than an accurate and any sort of objective sense recording of what happens. So it's, this is, Nita just gave a great description of a lot of the cognitive science of the last decade. One of the big insights from that field has been that what we used to think of as memory being uh, kind of stored someplace and then retrieved, and, but always remaining stored in, in some very fixed way has now been revised by a process called reconsolidation. So it turns out that memory goes through the process of encoding, storage, retrieval, and then each time it's retrieved, it gets restored, but it gets changed. So this reconsolidation process by itself transforms the memory. So when you think about what happened to you as a child, every time you think about that, it becomes a different memory in some sense. All memories, in a sense, become new and become revised. So there's never a perfectly accurate or single uh, representation of what happened, but one that's always under revision. Okay. Let's take a, that uh, woman sitting over on the side. Thank you so much for this interesting panel. Is there a way of measuring imagination or an individual's capacity to imagine? And the reason I ask that is because I remember as a child my mother telling my brothers and I we shouldn't watch television, we should read books because we wouldn't use our minds. And I remember thinking how silly that was. Um, and now with my own children, I'm telling them not, not to use devices. Do we know longitudinally over time if imagination has changed? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That's another great question. Uh, well, people have scanned uh, brains using functional MRI while the subjects were asked to imagine different things. And it turns out that when you're imagining the future, um, it activates some of the same areas as if you were recollecting a past memory of the same event. Uh, so there are some overlapping pathways. And one of the pathways um, that it seems to activate is called the default mode network. So the brain has two pathways, a task positive network, which is activated when you're actually doing something, and then a task negative network, which is kind of a resting uh, network, if you will, and imagination, at least it's believed things like daydreaming are believed to involve that network. So at baseline, the brain consumes a lot of energy, and that's involved in many of those processes. Uh, so I have never had anybody quantify how much a person daydreams over a week or a day, but that might be a fun experiment to do because a lot of creative ideas come from daydreaming. But I think you could tell your kids to put away their devices anyway, just so they'll spend more time with each other. 
there's a, a, a lot to be gained from social activity as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have a lot of hands up, but um, I think, did you have your hand up in the previous round? Or I know you did, so sorry. So we'll take this one and then and we'll go to you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Christopher from Adia. Uh, it strikes me that when you had the introduction, you mentioned disruptive technologies. But then when we had this discussion, we were very much talking about signals which already exist, which could be read better, you know, discovering if somebody is drowsy, discover, uh, dis re discovering whether somebody lies, uh, discovering whether somebody is hungry. These are all sort of, uh, And I don't know much about these things, but uh, I had one specific uh, question. There seems to be these stories that if you put people under hypnosis, Hypnosis is that make, can, you can make them things, do things which they then don't remember. And vice versa, it's used, as far as I know, to uh, unearth memories or thoughts which are otherwise not present. And I was just wondering what the, whether there is some sort of boundary, whether this has been investigated um, in doing something really which we cannot do or understand or signal uh, without these new devices and technologies. So you bring up a good question. Hypnosis is one example, uh, and actually it's not so different from the example Morali used of a vegetative state. Uh, and the hope is that you could use uh, fMRI as a way of reading out what's going on in the brain in a way that you couldn't uh, obtain in any other fashion. There has been a little bit of work with hypnosis and fMRI, and I'm afraid I can't cite you exactly what the results are. I don't think they've been particularly surprising. Uh, there have been actually very few moments in which fMRI has told us something that we didn't already know. It's given us regional representation, but it rarely told us, and you heard the great example of the vegetative state, because that's one place where it really did tell us something we didn't know. For the most part, whether it's hypnosis or whether we're studying other kinds of mental phenomena that seem to be mysterious to us, uh, it's been quite difficult, for instance, to um, image hallucinations. Well, it's true that in imaging hallucinations, you can see cortical activity over the auditory cortex without seeing the thalamic activity, without seeing the underlying activity. Uh, so you have a picture of a brain that's generating the sound rather than actually hearing it through the auditory system. But after all, we sort of knew that anyway. Uh, so it didn't tell us something we didn't know. It's lovely to see that uh, with the technology, but it's not particularly insightful beyond just the demonstration. But I'd like to build on that for just a moment. Um, Ariel mentioned this earlier, and so, so I'll echo something that she said, but part of what I think is disruptive about these technologies isn't um, what we can see, because it's a matter of degree rather than a matter of kind. Um, but it's also who has access to the information. That's one of the things that's very disruptive um, in a positive way in many, in many instances. So the fact that there are consumer-based devices that enable you, even in very simplistic ways, to be able to have access to your brain state in ways that you didn't have before. Um, or consumer-based devices like the one that Morali mentioned, transcranial direct current stimulation, which not only can you build as a kit yourself, but you can also buy from companies like Focus or a new one that's coming out that's similar by Think. These are things that put into the hands of individual consumers access to information that they never were able to see themselves. So when 26% or so of people said they would give access to their memories to their doctor, that's because our traditional model of healthcare and our traditional way of accessing ourselves has been to go through our physicians to get access to that information or to make changes to who we are and how we think and how we feel. But with technologies that put that information in the hands of individual consumers, suddenly the healthcare system, the traditional mode of delivering information to you about yourself, has been utterly changed as a direct-to-consumer model instead of a healthcare-delivered model. That has enormous implications, not just in neurotechnologies, but across the board of direct-to-consumer um, access to health information and information about brain states. So I do think it is disruptive, at least to the healthcare industry, if not to more, in how we think about these types of information and these types of technologies. Hey, this was a really fascinating discussion. Uh, one of the things that, 
the panel discussed that was really interesting is this question of invasive mind reading, figuring out what someone is thinking against their will. Uh, but I actually wanted to challenge the panel to, as to what the real killer app is for that. Uh, the example that was shown, that was sort of people discussed repeatedly, is memory. But I already pretty much try to avoid relying on my memory for anything. Many people I know at Google Glass would just have a glass record everything so they didn't have to bother remembering it. And as digital recording becomes increasingly ubiquitous, and that technology is developing far faster than mind reading is, I find it hard to imagine that 25 years from now, anyone is going to want to rely on an eyewitness for anything, right? Humans are just crummy at memory and we're kind of outsourcing it anyway. So my question is, okay, you know, if you can invasively mind read, so what, right? What are the things that you would want to mind read, assume given that a person's memories are actually not terribly interesting? <laughs> so I, for me, um, I think, it's about the nature of interpersonal relationships more than anything else. So uh, if you say, so what about your memory? Um, that's great. Uh, I agree with you that a lot of memory is so fallible anyway that I try not to rely on my memory, particularly when I'm jet lagged, that's a terrible time. Or I have a newborn at home, that's a terrible time of sleep deprivation, I'm not gonna remember anything. Um, but there are a million white lies we tell during the day to socialize with one another. There are a million things that we left unsaid because they're better left unsaid because with a cooler head, we might not think or say the thing that uh, first pops to mind. Um, and that may change if we ever got to this uh, imagined world of really being able to have access to all of the information in your head. So if you had a little thought bubble that said everything that you were thinking at all times, um, the nature of our relationships would fundamentally change. Now, would that be a good thing? Would we have much greater transparency and much greater honesty and have to build our relationships on some different kind of future? We would, and we would figure out a way to get along, hopefully. Um, but I think the nature of who we are and how we interact with each other depends in part on having some ability of private space or private repose. To me, one, oh, sorry. Oh, to me, one of the killer apps is having self-knowledge and self-experience. You know, we think about people who actually understand their emotional state or understand what really is going on in their mind as evolved individuals. How many times have you come home because you've had something at work that was annoying to you and now you're unfortunately unkind to your kids because you're still holding that or you're still aggravated by that? When we're able to have perfect and pure introspection, we're able, not that such a thing is actually possible, but um, as we come closer and closer to real introspection, we can begin to understand our internal thoughts or feelings in ourselves and then make much better decisions about how we interact with the world because we have much better information for those decisions. It's interesting where this conversation is going because, Ian, you started us off by saying, who would you trust to have the data? And what you're hearing from all of us is, we trust ourselves, and that's about it, right? Uh, but we're not even sure we're very good at trusting ourselves because we're not, we need help using technology to know about our own inner self. Do you have anything to add? I, I, I think it's possible that we may get used to it eventually, so the person who asked the question is right. I mean, I'm thinking of a very old, ancient example, you know, when Netflix first came out, or video libraries first came out, all of us used to you know, check out videos. And of course, the video store owner knew a lot about our tastes. And I think I know a few cases where politicians were forced to resign based on the types of videos they were renting. But then I kind of, we, we got used to that information. We started trusting Netflix, and we started trusting everybody else. And it's possible that as um, brain gadgets become very ubiquitous, uh, we may all get habituated and say that's just another piece of information. So it depends on who you're trusting with. Maybe we won't trust the government, maybe we won't trust you know, certain uh, groups, but maybe we'll trust marketeers, maybe we'll trust big commercial companies because they got too much data and they're not going to hold it against us. So it's possible that may be a way that we may evolve. I hope there's, not. <laughs> there's also lots of ways in which technology already knows things about ourselves and adjusts its interaction so that we can live happier lives. For example, the phone, when I put it up to my face, turns off the screen so I'm not dialing with my cheek. This is the phone knowing my intention, making a call, knowing the orientation, and then 
changing its behavior so that it can support my interaction. In the future, your technology may know things about you and it will be subtly changing itself in the background so that it can support your behaviors more effectively. So maybe you'll fall asleep and your phone will stop pushing notifications to you that wake you up in the middle of the night. Okay, so um, I, I'm sorry, but we, we have to start wrapping up here. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you to uh, take one minute now to reflect on what we've spoken about and uh, identify one issue related to mind reading that you would like to see the WEF community, uh, which is WEF and, and all of the people who are here, to engage in. So Ariel, you want to go first? Sure. So this has been an extraordinarily fascinating decision, and thank you very much for having the forum to do so. These are things that I think about all the time and glad to be sharing them with all of you. Um, a lot of what we talked about is, you know, is this technology really effective? Is this actually going to be good for anything? And there are actually a lot of solutions that are available now that really are efficacious and have impact and have been improving people's lives every single day. So I invite you to be, you know, curious and skeptical about the future and also really think about the, the ways that we use mind reading and big quotation marks technologies now to enhance our lives. I think I'm going back to the original example that I gave, which is where I think um, the application is perhaps uh, best validated, even though even in the setting of a vegetative patient, there are many um, uh, chinks to be worked out. Uh, but I think I would really hope that with using this technology, we can figure out who is truly brain dead and who is not brain dead, because there have been people who have been in vegetative states for 20 plus years. And if there's anything we can do to figure out one way or the other how best to help the families and the individual, I think we will do an immediate service um, to society. My hope for the WEF community is to increase public understanding and awareness of these technologies and what they can really do. So when we talk about advances in neuroscience, either people are unaware of them, um, they are uh, aware of them and terrified because they think that we can actually do things like eavesdrop on your brain and decode what you're thinking, um, or they have a little bit of awareness of it and don't really understand a lot of the intricacies enough to engage in some process of democratic deliberation about its appropriate uses. And I think this kind of community is an ideal one to be able to advance the public understanding of neuroscience and neurotechnologies um, and to be able to use that advanced understanding toward the process of an international dialogue of democratic deliberation about what the uses and ethical boundaries are on these types of technologies. So my hope is that this kind of a conversation we're having here today is a conversation that will spread much more widely so that we can truly engage together in figuring out how we want these technologies to be introduced into the world. I never want to sit but, uh, after Nita in the future, so we have to make sure we change the seating arrangements. Um, I, I want to uh, go back to the idea that if we don't call this mind reading, but we think about um, helping uh, people who have serious mind problems, that I think there's a real opportunity here. So rather than the WEF community um, sort of shrieking about the potential violations of privacy, which are important issues, um, the question I would have is, can we leverage this? Uh, can we leverage the technologies, both for the diagnosis and potentially the treatment of mental disorders, a group of disorders that cause more disability uh, and more morbidity and more mortality in young people than any other disorders that we deal with. The 21st century is gonna be the century of chronic non-communicable diseases. These are the chronic diseases of young people and we don't have the tools we need to help them. So uh, it would be terrific if the kinds of things we've been talking about could either be used for more uh, rapid and successful diagnosis early on or hopefully to provide interventions that will help change the trajectory of brain and mind development so that uh, these kids would uh, be able to live healthy lives. Thank you. Well, I hope you all have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, this has been a really stimulating discussion that has really you know, expanded my view of what mind reading consists of and what it might mean for us and 
if anything at all. Uh, so there are going to be two more what-if sessions uh, in the course of this meeting. I believe they're both on Friday, so I highly recommend that you check them out if you, if you have the opportunity. And please join me now in thanking our wonderful panel for this great discussion. Thank you.